Good evening to you all. Here we are in Blue Sky, London. Lovely to see you. Hopefully the sound's all right and I look vaguely presentable. Hey, Matthew, JJ, Jeremy, P, Sarah, hi, Tish, Catherine, Jill, Ruth, Laura, AK, Lauren, Marty. It's lovely to see you. Hey, LS, Elizabeth, Elaine. Welcome, Cheryl. Here we are, not too far away from young Nick, who is doing a tour in this direction. So he's way over there in that direction. Not too far, maybe half a mile from here. I promise we won't cross the streams. Hi guys, it's Gerard here. We are on the cusp of the Strand and Fleet Street in that direction. And we're going to take a little walk from here all the way to Trafalgar Square. We're going to talk about a few theatres and show you a few landmarks. Next tour, I believe, is a great fire tour. And uh, that, that's still going on. You're very welcome, if you get bored with me, to join his tour. Hey, Diane, good to see you. Let's turn us around. Let's show you a few things. Tisha said never. Well, that's lovely. There's a McMullen's pub for you there. 1827, the McMullen's brewery started, and that's the old Bank of England building. It's a beautiful, beautiful pub. And it looks a lot cooler and trendier and ornate than the folks that go inside. Everyone just goes inside there. It's just a regular pub. And from the outside, it can look a bit imposing. Now, in that direction, all the way over there, that's Fleet Street. So we're right on the edge. And we know we're on the edge of Fleet Street and Strand. Fleet Street is part of the city of London. And Strand is part of the city of Westminster. It's a part of central London or the West End. And we know exactly we're here. Because, first of all, there is a sign saying this is where the Strand starts. So the Strand starts here. But the other main reason is we have a monument to the old Temple Gates. And that was leading into London, so the customs houses would stop people here. It would have originally been a bit more ornate and wider, so it would have crossed the entire street. But we're entering the West End rather than the financial district, the City of London. The road itself, we've just started to walk along, is called Strand, not as most of us call it, the Strand. Strand being an old Germanic word for riverbank. In some languages, Strand simply means beach. But this Strand, it, it, it marks the, the old bank of the River Thames. So the River Thames was a lot wider. We gradually reclaimed it over the years built 86 miles of sewer pipes underneath down towards the river and the Thames is the longest river entirely in England it's 215 miles or 346 kilometers but the longest river in the UK is the Severn which is only five miles longer but some of that is in Wales and there's the old dragon of the city of London so now we know, we know for definite we're in the West End. And look at that ornate architecture. So from here to where we're going, we're going about 1,200 metres, about three quarters of a mile. There was originally, as I said, a gate here. It would have been a proper gatehouse when London was extended. The gatehouse itself went to a different park outside of London, Theobald's Park. And now it's been moved back to London. And maybe Nick will show us that later on. Because he ends, I know he ends his great fire tour near St. Paul's Cathedral and in Paternoster Square, around the side of St. Paul's. That's where the gate has gone. 
The building here is the Royal Courts of Justice. So we've gone on Fleet Street, now we're on the Strand, both related to rivers, really. There was an old river fleet, which starts in Hampstead. I know Gary does a great Hampstead tour, comes through King's Cross, which would be behind all of these buildings. It trickles out down in the River Thames. But most of the rivers of London are now covered or run alongside sewer pipes. Fleet Street was, of course, home to the press from the 1500s, really, until the 1980s, when News International owned by, of course, the infamous Rupert Murdoch. They moved to Wapping in East London. Hello, sunny Pennsylvania. Lovely stuff, Grace. But this building in front of us is the Royal Courts of Justice. It was built in the 1870s. It's in Victorian Gothic style, opened by Queen Victoria in 1882. And it's a, a large courthouse, but it's for civil cases rather than criminal cases. You often see it on the news, people bringing people to court, suing people. So a lot of it is financial, what goes on here. My brother works for this department. He's an accountant for the Royal Courts of Justice, but he's not based here. He's based at Canary Wharf, which is in East London. So we're coming up the Strand. We've left Fleet Street. There are no roads in the city, or there weren't, because it was an old city. The word road wasn't used until the 1500s. William Shakespeare, they say, was the man that invented the word road. But he didn't. They say Shakespeare invented a lot of words. But if you take a spin on that, the words were first in print in a lot of his plays. It doesn't necessarily mean that he invented them. I told a, a group that I was with the other day, just for a laugh, that Shakespeare invented the phrase hashtag. This woman was with her two children. She went, oh, really? I said, no, 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 get out. I asked her to leave. I didn't. There is another part of a road in Islington, Goswell Road, which when the District of London was extended in the 1990s, part of Goswell Road became part of London. The church we're in front of is St. Clement's Dane. There is a famous nursery rhyme, and it goes, oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. But there are a few St. Clement's, so it might not be necessarily this one. I apologize I sang for you there, but, well, it's my tour. You can mute me, of course. This is Samuel Johnson. Now, before this guy was around, you often had people spelling words differently. He basically standardized English by inventing the dictionary. This is a wonderful statue of him outside St. Clement Danes. Talking of Shakespeare, we have 14 words in Shakespeare's handwriting. That's all we have to go on. The words by me in his will and 12 words, which are his signature six times. And each signature is spelt differently. There was no official way to spell in William Shakespeare's time. Often people spelt in the language or the dialect of the people they were writing to. So imagine my name is spelt G-E-R-A-R-D. If I was writing to, let's say, someone from Canada or America, and I wanted them to pronounce Jared the way my mum says it, I would probably spell it to them J E R R A D, Jared, or Jared. Because I know that Canadians and Americans say Gerard. Hey, Gerard. And I like it. It makes me sound cool. And I don't mind what people call me, as long as they don't swear. Now, the building itself, this wonderful church, opened in 1682. 
Almost all of it was destroyed in the Blitz, 1940 and 41, the bombings of London, and it was restored in the 1950s. And it is the church of the Royal Air Force, which is why I'm going to show you the statue of this heroic man here. Let's turn around. And this is Sir Arthur Harris in the Royal Air Force. The bullet holes in the wall, so that was some of the bomb damage from 1940 and 41. A lot of the buildings in London that were bomb damaged, if they could get away with leaving the bomb damage, the shrapnel marks in the churches and in the buildings, they did. Because it was a sign never to forget. We should obviously never forget these things that have happened, but in generations to come, people will ask these questions. What are these marks on these buildings? Oh, here we go. So that's, uh, L has said, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens. I'm not going to read the whole thing out or sing the whole thing. But you've got the entire, what we say is a nursery rhyme. Diana said, Jared, you should look up Sir Keith Park when you have a moment. I definitely will. That sounds great, Diane. I love a good suggestion. I'll try and get as far back as I can. Obviously, London is a lot greener than we think when we're just walking around the stone, cobbled and paved streets. There's so many trees here. Beautifully lit. And it's what they call an island church. So there is a road that goes all the way around it. RAF hero, Diane said. So we'll have a look at that. Bomber Harris. That's it. That's it, John. So this man was known as Bomber Harris. The Dambusters. As we turn around, I just want to show you that they have been doing quite a bit of work here planting some wild flowers and some wild shrubs. They're pedestrianizing a lot of this area and they started it when the first lockdown came. Back in March of 2020, the end of March. So they're pedestrianizing a lot, makes it look a lot more beautiful. And there is of course King's College way in the distance there. And they want the students to maybe come out and relax in between classes. building in front, again, kind of covered by trees, is Australia House. So it's the Australian High Commission. What we would know if they were not part of the Commonwealth as an embassy. And then there's another island church beyond us. So the only two island churches, which are surrounded by roads, really, they, although they've slightly been pedestrianised, are in this area. The other one is called St. Mary Le Strand. When I first came back into London, after the restrictions ended, this road in the distance was all one way. It was all coming towards us, the traffic. So like that car on the right. And now the bit I'm stood on, the traffic is behind us. So they have totally redesigned the roads here. And around there, that is Aldwych. which was where, when the Vikings came to London, to London City, most of the people moved to, to this area. They moved west from the city. And also behind here, we have the Aldwych and Strand Tube. Now, it is my plan to do, at some point, it involves a lot of planning, research, and a lot of filming, a tube and transport system series of tours because we have some of the greatest train stations in the country but often you can't film in there when it's really packed it's just you're, you're dicing you're dicing with death when it's rush hour and often rush hour is the best time to do a tour because you get more people watching so it may have to be something either late night or early morning where I can film different tube stations. 
but we have a lot of closed stations in London. One of the most famous ones is seen worldwide in Hollywood movies and TV shows is the Aldwych or Strand tube station. It's part of the Piccadilly Railway. Opened in 1907, so it's a bit just beyond uh, with the red door. There's an entrance and an exit. So you entered through there. And just down here where the light is better, I'll be able to show you the exit. The Piccadilly Railway, Aldwych Strand Tube. It only went to Holborn, didn't go far, went less than a mile up the road, didn't sell well. 1907 it opened, from 1962 it was only used at peak hours. And then in the early 1990s the lifts broke and they decided it was too expensive to repair. So in 94 it closed down. The design, a lot of these old tube stations, the red tile design is by a man named Leslie Green. It's very iconic to London. It's been in many films. The platform and the track down there is unused now, but they still keep it in some kind of nice state of maintenance. And it's been used in TV shows like Sherlock, Doctor Who, Mr. Selfridge was used in the film Darkest Hour, starring Gary Oldman. Atonement, James McAvoy. And a film I had a tiny part in, V for Vendetta, they filmed here. If any of you haven't met me before, I've been an actor 20 years, longer than I care to remember. And uh, V for Vendetta is all set on the 5th of November and they film on this station here. Originally, when it was built, the plan was to go way further up north, beyond Holborn, beyond King's Cross, towards Alexandra Palace, which is up near Finsbury Park in North London, a great high point of London, but it never happened. In 1917, during World War I, 300 National Gallery paintings were stored there. And then many pieces of art were stored on the platform during World War II from the British Museum. Hugh has said, V was an excellent movie. Congrats. Well, cheers, Hugh. When you look at the finished product, I've got a couple of lines in the film. I did film for three weeks at Babelsberg Studios in Berlin, where they made Metropolis. So I had the time of my life filming. At least I'm still in the film, I suppose. That's the other entrance. We haven't even touched a theater. And that's what we're gonna do now. We're going to rush past King's College. Now, all of this has been pedestrianised. The bikes are still here, but there will be no cars here. So beyond this scaffolding, they have taken off a lot of the scaffolding beyond. And this is St. Mary Le Strand, another one of these island churches. They were having a service there earlier when I walked past. So this originally, if I drove into town, I would be driving along this road and then driving along the Strand. But when I last did this tour, this was all completely covered in scaffolding. It is obviously, there are some barriers on the right hand side, but just beyond the church, it's now completely empty and it will be pedestrianized. And there will be plants, wild flowers, plants which attract pollutants. A lot of the trees we see attract pollutants, so they're good for the air. The first Clean Air Act in London was way before any other major city. It was in the 1850s, and it was after the Great Stink in 1848, where the river boiled and bubbled up. 
the smell. They didn't deal with the smell. They didn't think it was worth dealing with. And then gradually the smell reached outside the Houses of Parliament and they thought, we need to do something about this. The politicians are not happy. It's spoiling their lockdown parties. So they've removed all of this. This was all completely covered the last time they did this walk. This is Somerset House, by the way. They have got an event going on. I'm not sure what the event is. They have a Courtel Gallery. C-O-U-R-T-A-U-L-D. Courtel Gallery. So they have a big event going in there tonight. I might, I might quickly walk along here. Neoclassical, built on the site of an old Tudor palace. The Tudor palace until 1603, and then I suppose it became the Stuart Palace. But this building itself is from 1776. And it was designed, the architect was a Scottish, Swedish architect named William Chambers. And if you've ever been on my Kew Gardens tour, William Chambers designed a lot of the structures, not the glass houses, but a lot of the stone structures at Kew Gardens, include an event here later in the week and this is their catering area so they're doing all the catering and doing all the electric lighting and sound I thought it was nice to have a look at yeah, Ruth has said losing signal. So just refresh. I shouldn't really have popped in here. But I wanted to show us, see if we could. Okay, let's get back out because I'm underneath stone, thick stone. Anyone that can hear me. I didn't say anything of too much importance there. The reason we lost the signal was it was somewhere that was not really part of the tour. I just wanted us to pop in very, very briefly. The signal should be back up top now. So apologies for that. I just can't resist when I see an open gateway. So many of the buildings along the Strand had titles in them after dukes and earls who lived there. So you had an Arundel house, Cecil House, Villiers House, Salisbury House, York House. And then in about 1630, a man named Inigo Jones built and redesigned the piazza in Covent Garden and they created the Covent Garden market. And everything changed. All the aristocracy moved from the Strand area further west to areas like Piccadilly. I want to show us a photo because there was an old theatre here called The Gaiety. It was a musical, opened in 1859. But if I can get the right shot of it, it's exactly the same look as the photograph, you'll see what it used to look like. Now, buildings are protected in London. Some of them are very historic. And there are laws telling us what we can and can't do to them. So if it's grade one listed, that means you can't do anything to it at all. But most of this started in the 1960s, the National Heritage List of Protected Buildings. So there are some that are gone forever, just before all of these regulations came in. And this is one building that went. So this is now the Marconi Hotel. But I'm right a right angle to show you the picture of the old Gaiety Theatre. Now, you may get a bit of a shock and think, why did they get rid of this? So it's on the chat now. This was here before this building. It's a shame, right? 
There was a bunch of dancers called the Gaiety Girls that worked here. Catherine has said it's majestic, don't like the modern. I totally get what you mean. The building in blue there, showing Mamma Mia, that's the Aldwych Theatre. I'm going to try and show us another image of this road all the way around. I'm trying to get exactly the right angle. Let's see if I can do this here. So this is a similar angle to where we are now. And that's the Aldwych on the corner. Obviously the horse-drawn carriages, an early use of cars. And look at these cars now. These are people trying to go around this new two-way system as opposed to one way. So we've got the Aldwych and the Novello, two theatres together, and the bit right in the centre of the screen, right in the centre now, which is lit by very small, almost candlelight chandeliers, is the Waldorf Hotel. William Waldorf Astor decided to build two theatres and a hotel in the middle. William Waldorf Astor, of course, the Gilded Age. Ivan Novello was in The Lodger, one of Alfred Hitchcock's first films. And he wrote a very famous war song called Keep the Home Fires Burning. This road is Catherine Street, by the way. It's home of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, which is strange. The Theatre Royal Drury Lane was originally on Drury Lane, which is now at the back of the theatre. In 1795, a man named Richard Brinsley Sheridan decided to rebuild it, and he wanted his entrance facing Covent Garden to attract a better sort of person. Drury Lane had gone a bit downhill. But he also decided, marketing-wise, not to change the name. Jennifer says she loves Hitchcock's The Lodger. Love it. This is the Duchess Theatre, opened in 1929. It's showing the play that goes wrong. Mischief Theatre are the company that perform here. They were originally a pub theatre company. And Sonia Friedman, the great producer, for instance, she produces Harry Potter and the Cursed Child in town, one of the big theatre producers, along with Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh, she saw them in a pub theatre and she said, I want to take you into the West End. So she paid for them to go in here. Then they went to Broadway, then they got a BBC TV show and then they created a magic show, Magic Goes Wrong, with Penn and Teller doing all of the magic. Ah, Kaylin has said, wait, isn't Drury Lane where the Muffin Man lives? Yes, Kaylin. Drury Lane, which is at the back of us now. I am bearing in mind that I called this tour the Strand, but I am veering up Catherine Street. I'm kind of going off, off piste, as they say, P-I-S-T-E, in case you misheard me. That's the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, but it's on Catherine Street. At the back, to the right, Drury Lane was home in the late 1600s to many bakers. Different breads and different pastries were made there. We don't know for definite who the Muffin Man was, but we know there would have been somebody called the Muffin Man. And that's the Theatre Royal Drury Lane up there. That's part of my other tour, the first theatres in London. Drury Lane opened in 1663. And it's still going strong. I say still going strong. It's burnt down twice and been demolished once. So it's not the same building. It's got the same name. And that's the side of the Marconi Hotel. But we're just going to take a right up Exeter Street and then cut back onto the Strand, and I'm going to show you the front of the Lyceum Theatre. The Lyceum, we've seen it on quite a few different tours. So my Royal Tour, I sometimes start here. My first theatres in the West End often starts or comes to this area. So it's not strictly a Strand Theatre because the entrance 
is here on Wellington Street. There was a theatre here from the 1700s. This building in particular is from 1834. It's been home to the Lion King since 1999. It's in its 23rd year. It's been a disco, a cinema. A home to Madame Tussaud or Two Swords. Waxworks. First time it was shown in London. Her wax exhibits were here. Right at the top, there was an office there in the center of the screen where Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, stayed for many years. And that's where we believe, for 20 years, he worked here as a business manager. And we believe that's where he wrote most of Dracula. So the road, as I said, was popular with diplomats aristocracy. They wanted a base pretty close to Whitehall, which is further to the right, past Trafalgar Square, and also close to the city. After the market opened in the 1630s, this area just got loud. It got grimy. So they moved further west and further north. But remnants of those buildings, not the buildings themselves, but the names, the ghost names of these buildings still remain. And one just around the corner, the Savoy Palace has been renamed the Savoy Hotel, Savoy Theatre, and there's still a Savoy Chapel. If you can imagine, this area was where the theatres were first rebuilt after the restoration of Charles II. And it was edgy. Drury Lane itself, even though they put a royal theatre or a theatre royal there, there were many inns of ill repute, brothels, pubs, gin palaces, coffee shops where people would do dodgy dealings, or maybe not so dodgy. But it was a place of secrecy. And at one point, 23 brothels on Drury Lane were raided in one weekend. Just up beyond the cab is a restaurant which closed down after our first lockdown, as every other place did, almost worldwide. And sadly, it has not reopened. But I saw lights in it tonight for the first time since pre restrictions ended and it's Simpsons in the Strand it was originally known as a coffee house opened in 1828 in the late 1800s Simpsons was known for chess tournaments and the invention of the food trolley became very popular here so they could wheel up your roast meat and carve it at your table along the carpeted floors without disturbing the chess match. And P.G. Woodhouse, the great writer, called it a restful temple of food. Look at the ornate work here. These are just on regular lampposts. Look here, if we get a nice shot of this, without cabs. You might be able to see the chessboard and some of the pieces. So it's known as the home of chess. And I saw a man named Magnus Carlsen, supposedly the best chess player in the world. About six years ago in the World Chess Championships, I came here for the day. My partner, Catherine, said, are you mad? I'm spending a whole day watching chess. And I said, I couldn't think of a nicer way to spend my day. Me and another bunch of geeks, it was heaven. Diana said, if Simpsons reopens, it's on my to-do list. I'll start saving. Well, I'll see you there, Diane. Let's try and get a closer look. So you can see on either side, this is not real hedging. But there's your rook or castle. There's the chess pieces, so still considered the home of chess. Now, happy
have to see it from this point of view. There's the night. You can hear people applauding, they're not applauding me. It's people outside the Strand Palace Hotel. This building here was a hotel in 1907. Then it was redesigned to be Art Deco in the 1930s. Had the first computerized billing system in London. That was in 1968. And for the US Army, it's quite an important place, or any descendants of. It was used as a major recuperation venue for the US Army during World War II. The Regent Palace Hotel was used for the Canadian Air Force. So not too far from here either. And let's just show you Savoy Court here. The Savoy Theatre itself is down to the left, almost all underground. Quite a few of the theatres in the West End were underground and stayed open during the Second World War. They felt safe. It opened in 1881, the first building to be completely lit by electricity in the world. John said when he worked in London, his employer always put him into the Strand Palace. Oh, that's nice. Real historic, historic building. So this, I would assume, is Casper the Cat. They have a story at the Savoy. And if you book a table for 13, they will give you one extra seat for Casper the Cat. They just make up an extra place setting because they consider 13 an unlucky number. So this is probably right why the hedgerow is here. And the Savoy itself at the moment is showing Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman. You could say it's based on My Fair Lady and Pygmalion. It's one of the big West End shows at the moment. But the Savoy, you notice here, the road is on the right-hand side. So you come in on the right and you exit on the left. And some on this tour may well say that's the right way of doing it. It's only that it's a sharp turn. That's why you can't take a sharp left. And also, because our steering wheels are on the right, if a cab driver takes somebody up there, the Savoy entrance, the lobby, the foyer, up there the driver can get out pavement or curb side rather than roadside. So it's quite clever. A lot of people used to think, oh, it's only because they loved Americans that they did it. They do love Americans as well. Don't all rags to riches story go? Yeah, they go back to Cinderella, Jason. It's true, but uh, when George Bernard Shaw wrote Pygmalion, it was based on a newspaper article of something that actually happened, a professor of phonetics that took in a girl. So there wasn't a, a real article about it that Bernard Shaw wrote the play based on. But yeah, it's all based on Cinderella. Jonathan, a question. Why is the facade of the Savoy styled like a Rolls Royce? Every day I passed it, I thought it looked awful. Well, I don't know, 1880s, maybe. I mean, that is, I need to research it a bit more. There's a knight up there. This was the site of the old Savoy Palace. So this fella, maybe is one of the knights of the Savoy, Maybe that's why. It's on the site of an old palace. That's probably why. In 1990, a fire destroyed a lot of it. They've restored it, but they've mainly made it Art Deco now. Yes, interesting Pygmalion. I, I didn't know that. I need to do some more research into that, actually, as well. Because when I saw My Fair Lady, and then I auditioned for it, one of the productions in town I did a lot of research and they said that Bernard Shaw's play was kind of based on something that happened which I found I found fascinating 
There's a pub up here, some fellas outside it. It's called the Coal Hole. There was an actor that worked at Drury Lane, Edmund Keane, and he used to frequent this place in the 1800s. And he started a club called the Wolf Club. And he said it was a club for men whose wives would not allow them to sing in the bath. So maybe there's some of the folks here, their, their partners won't allow them to do that either. And this was a great haunt of Richard Harris. Catherine said, the American bar in the Savoy is my favorite bar in much of London. Ah, that's lovely. The American bar is wonderful. And they also, at the Savoy, have a cocktail museum, which is fascinating. The idea of cocktails were originally so they could hide the taste of bad alcohol during prohibition by mixing it with different fruits. And now cocktails are the bee's knees, aren't they? And the idea of cocktails today is spending a fortune. Back then, they're hiding gin. And gin used to have paraffin in it. Jason has said, is that your knowledge set around theatre and drama? I did amateur acting. Most exciting thing ever. Jason, it is really exciting. I've been a professional actor nearly 25 years. So I trained at drama school back in 97, 98. And I've been trying to hustle ever since. You never find that you can make all your money from acting. Kind of wish I could, but if I only did acting, I'd probably be quite quite shallow. I'd live a, maybe a bit more of a, a secretive life. I do know actors that are quite well known, friends of mine who I trained with and worked with, and they long for the days when they did pub theatre and they got the odd gig now and then. And I say, yeah, but you're, you're famous, you're making money. And they said, yeah, the fame, not so much. The money is wonderful. And I heard a good phrase years ago that film makes you famous, TV makes you rich, but theatre makes you happy. And I suppose with theatre, you can end up acting and you can be on the tube home with everyone else because you've got costume and makeup on. They might not be able to know it's you. This is the Vaudeville. The biggest show I was in, probably the most successful show was at the Haymarket Theatre. I did a, um, a version of Fatal Attraction, directed by Trevor Nunn. Starred Kristen Davis from Sex and the City, Natasha McElhone, who was in Californication, and what's that one with Keitha Sutherland? Keitha Sutherland, uh, designated survivor. She played his wife in that, that wonderful thing. And, uh, yeah, I was in that. And it was one of my ambitions after leaving drama school to always work with Trevor Nunn, Sir Trevor Nunn. And I managed to do that. So everything else, everything else since then, well, it pales into insignificance. Now, this is the Vaudeville Theatre. I'm supposed to have three minutes left, and I'm only halfway down the strand. But I think other guides, they, they go on, so maybe I'll go on. I don't want to upset other guides though 690 seats uh 1870 it opened 1891 it was remodeled to look like a townhouse so it was supposed to resemble other townhouses in the area in the 1950s an actor was working on stage in a show called salad days and a seven-year-old boy came up to stage door with his parents at the end and he said can i meet the actor I want to know how the magic piano works. And so the actor took the kid backstage and showed him. And that little boy was inspired to go years later into theatre production. That boy became Sir Cameron Mackintosh. And it all happened here. This building is from 1926. In the 1920s, a lot of Scandinavian drama. Yeah, the vaudeville, a vaudevillian reference. So we used to call it Music Hall or Variety rather than Vaudeville. The theatre doesn't just show Vaudeville, but the show on at the moment is very Vaudevillian. It's called Six, and it's about Cleves, Howard, Parr, Aragon, Ball, Berlin, Seymour, the six wives of Henry VIII. So it's telling the story from their point of view, which we don't often hear. 
Let me show you a photo of how it looked about a hundred years ago. Literally, it's on the chat now. Hardly anything has changed. I love it. The amount of buildings that do not change in London. Just up here, one of my favorite shows in town. Back to the Future, the musical. So the book and the lyrics and the music are written by the same people who made the film. Christopher Lloyd was in recently, came to see it. He approved. The building itself holds about 1,800. It's the fourth theatre on the site. And it's what is known as most theatres are in the West End. It's what they call a receiving house. It's had five different names. It was originally, in 1806, called the Sans Pareil, which means the without parallel. Is it also accommodation for the actors, Jason? No. We don't do that as much in the West End. They do it if you work for the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon or you work in regional theatre, they often put you up in apartments. But here you've got to make your way home. In 1844, it was known as the Adelphi. 1858, the new Adelphi. Happens a lot to theatres in the West End. They, they can never satisfy themselves. They can never settle on a name. In 1901, they called it the Century Theatre. And then in 1930, this building, it's Art Deco style. A lot of the cinemas, the picture houses and theatres. There were six theatres in the West End built in 1930. And uh, it's got a complete absence of curves. OK, what is upstairs at the Boardville's? It's literally still part of the theatre. It's on four levels. Matthew and Michael, how far to Trafalgar Fountains? Well, I'm going to make a run for it. I said we'd end up at Trafalgar Square. That's exactly what we're going to do. I'll talk about the Adelphi on the way. The Royal Adelphi, it should be called. Charles Dickens, many of his adaptations. Literally, when the books came out, they adapted them into plays. The Pickwick Papers, Nicholas Nickleby, they both opened in 1837. In 1844, the first production of A Christmas Carol, which I am reading at Christmas, by the way, in three parts. So expect to find that on the schedule for December. Me reading at home A Christmas Carol. First production of that, it was called Past, Present and Future. And it opened in February. February 1844. And it's called The Christmas Carol. Go figure. You may see a lot of people on the right. The building behind the trees was poking out in the center is the Charing Cross Police Station, but it was originally the Charing Cross Hospital. You know, the Sherlock Holmes novels, that is where John Watson has first been working when he meets Sherlock Holmes, but now it's a police station. And the building behind here is Zimbabwe House, and they always feed the homeless every night, the Zimbabwe Embassy, so there's a soup kitchen just there. Beth has said, Elementary, good show. I love Elementary. I think that might be my favourite Sherlock Holmes. Johnny Lee Miller playing Sherlock Holmes and Lucy Liu playing Joan Watson. Slightly takes a twist on it. Says that Sherlock Holmes, his father sends him to New York because of his addiction and he can work with the police department there. So that's the reason for him moving to New York. He's still... Sherlock Holmes from Baker Street. I love seeing this. I worked on that block many years ago. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So let's make a move. 
Talking about that Adelphi Theatre, you may have heard this from Natalie. She has wonderful dark history tours, as we know, a great inspiration to all of us. An actor, William Terrace, was murdered at the stage door of the Adelphi Theatre in December 1897. He's supposed to haunt quite a few places in and around this area. He can't make his mind up. There was a theatre named after him in south-east London, not too far from where I live, called the Terrace Theatre in Rotherhithe. So now we're approaching Trafalgar Square. What we've got here on the left is Charing Cross Station. The Charing means turning in the river. It's an old word for turning in the river. The cross is because of Edward I's wife, Eleanor of Castile. She died in Lincoln. There were 12 crosses put from Lincoln all the way to Westminster Abbey. So if you saw the funeral of Her Majesty on Monday, you will know the the sombre and the epic ceremonial lengths that we go to in this country when there is some state funeral, 12 crosses, and this is the cross at the turning in the river, the Charing Cross. This is the Claremont Hotel, what was known as the Charing Cross Hotel as well. And there are lots of trees in London, and lots of trees in the West End, but there's only one major one on the Strand, and it's this one. It's called the Storm Tree. It was planted in 1987. After the great storm of 87, when a quarter of a million trees were unearthed, uprooted in London, they planted this. Diana said, is it the only cross left? I'm not sure. Even that cross itself is not an original. That's a copy from the 1880s. Oh, thank you. Condolences about the passing of the Queen. It's been an amazingly momentous time, and it was a wonderful celebration of her life. The, the bit that got me, I'm sure it got a lot of you, when the carriage, the gun carriage, with the Majesty's coffin went past her corgis and her horse. That's what got me. Obviously seeing Charles, when they were singing God Save the King, the first time they sang that, and when they said King, it was like he was saying, this is not right, this is not what I've heard, I've never heard this before, and it, and it, it, it kind of broke his heart. Moments like that, those human moments. But it was a wonderful send-off for wonderful person. This is a conversation with Oscar Wilde. So it's a bench. You can sit here, have a little chat. <laughs> it says we were all in the gutters. Some of us are looking at the stars. And I think it's a lovely bench to have in an area where a lot of the homeless shelters are, to say we're all in the gutters, some of us are looking at the stars. Yeah, Tisha said loves the cigarette. The cigarette itself kept getting taken away. And uh, they put, they really welded that one on. That one will never go. People used to just break off the cigarette. It's a great landmark and just a little bench. But there are a couple of trees above it, so every now and then they need to give it a wipe down. And there's the quote itself. And now, obviously, a little bit further into the hour than we wanted, we're reaching Trafalgar Square and the National Gallery. Sorry, I'm taking a taking a bit of a speedy walk. There's a nightclub around here, Heaven, just down Villiers Street. And this pub, so nightclub is a gay nightclub, this is halfway to Heaven, a pub, have rebranded themselves to say, well, the club's expensive, but you can stop off here for a drink, halfway to Heaven, on the way. They're clever guys.
So we have our amazing National Gallery. It used to be down Pall Mall a bit further along. The road we're stopping on here is Charing Cross Road. So if we took a right, it would be Charing Cross Road. We'll take a tiny little left here. Which means we end up at the edge of Whitehall. So as you know, the procession went from Westminster all the way along Whitehall and it took a left down Horse Guards Parade before it reached Trafalgar Square. And I know that Gary does, and he will be doing a wonderful royal tour about the funeral procession itself, so do catch that. They have turned off the fountains recently. I don't know if they've turned them back on because we have had what we now call the hose pipe ban. So it's been very hot weather. They don't want to waste water. I, I originally thought it was just hose pipes that they had banned, not the use of the water. So I went out and bought, the day before the hose pipe ban, I bought 15 hose pipes and I said, I'll be all right. Let's have a look. That was close by the bus, Beth. Yes, it was. Yeah, heaven is still there. Yeah, sorry, I missed a bit of the chat because I was trying to avoid uh, a couple of buses. They always drive faster this time of night. Just going to give us a little vertical shot. This iconic structure here. You may have heard of it. It's pitch black, but it looks blue, which I love. We shall end here. We are in Trafalgar Square, where all points anywhere in the country are measured. So this is considered the center of London. Nice one. L. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? This is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, police station in the world. It's now a cleaner's cupboard. But originally you could put two naughty people in there and then you would ring Charing Cross Police Station just around the corner. So you could just lock two people up in there. And then just beyond it, that building there was known in the 1660s as number one, the Strand. It was the first numbered address in the country under the reign of Charles II. So it's perfect to end just here. Number one, the Strand. I'm going to bring you back to me. Thank you very much indeed. Hopefully that was something interesting. I enjoyed it. The Hippodrome Club is around here somewhere, previously known as the Talk of the Town. So, I will explain. Let me turn you around again. If we walk in this direction, along Charing Cross Road, you follow those cars and you curve round to the left, right at the centre of Leicester Square, just on the edge of Charing Cross Road, is the Hippodrome, which is now a casino and a performance venue, but it was in the 60s known as the talk of the town, a jazz venue. Many people played there and many great jazz and blues artists recorded albums there. But that's for another day. Thank you, Diane. And thank you to anyone that left any comments or contributions. It does help. I do come in to do these tours, as we all do. Now I've got to try and find my way home. But thank you very much. And lots of love, and I will see you in the next couple of days, hopefully. Lots of love to you all. Thank you very much. Au revoir.